Welcome to Candid Conversation number 703. Today's question, how did we get our Bible with chapters and verses in it? And now what I'm going to tell you is what I did the research on, what I found. Um, the thing is, you can't really go to the scripture, doesn't talk about it, so you can't really go to scripture to find out the answer. And the Bible is our authority, so it's hard to, it's hard for me to believe church history or what they tell you, but um, that's basically the best I have to go on, so I'm just going to tell you what I found out, and uh, hopefully it's true. The, uh, what I learned is that the originals did not have chapters and verses. You had books, um, you don't have chapters and verses in there. Now, um, the Psalms did have, those were divided up into the Psalms because Jesus said, I believe he referred to the second Psalm at one point. All other references to the Bible, quotes in the Bible, are to uh, writers. You know, Jesus would say, David says, or Isaiah says, um, you don't have, you know, in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, you don't have that. It's just that the Psalms, seems like those were divided into Psalms, but no, 150 Psalms, but no verses in there. The, so what I found out is a man, is an Archbishop Stephen Langton, and he worked on it toward the end of his life, and by 1227 AD, just before he died, he had finished all the chapter and verses coming up with those in the Bible. And uh, Wycliffe, John Wycliffe, when he did his first English Bible in 1382, uh, he used those chapter and verse divisions. Now, it makes me think, it didn't say it in my research, it makes me think that's a reference to the New Testament only because then I also read that there's this Hebrew uh, rabbi Nathan in 1448 that put the chapters and verses in the Hebrew Old Testament. So Hebrew Old Testament is the same as our English Old Testament. It's just that uh, the books are in a different order. So for your Old Testament, our Old Testament ends with the book of Malachi. The uh, Old Testament for Israel ends with the book of Second Chronicles. It has Malachi in it, but it's just in a different order. So all the, the books are the same. They're just placed in a different order for Israel. So it doesn't seem like there would be any... Um, in other words, if Stephen Langton put all the chapters and verses in there for the entire Bible, there wouldn't be a need 200 years later for this rabbi Nathan to come along and put chapters and verses in the Old Testament. So it makes me think that, and I know when Wycliffe came out with his English Bible, I believe he came out with just the New Testament. I could be wrong about that. Tyndale did that. Tyndale came out with the New Testament. So. I don't know, but anyway, what my research showed is that Stephen Langton, in 1227, had finished the chapters and verses. And then some rabbi named Nathan in 1448 also came up with the chapters and verses for the Old Testament. And those are the same, uh, those are the same today as back then. By, uh, all the really, when Wycliffe used the chapters and verses started in 1382 with his English Bible, then you had um, all the other translations that came out after that used the same chapter and verse divisions. The Geneva Bible used the, the same ones, and the King James was largely based on the Geneva Bible, and so, um, and, and I know like the Catholic Bible today, they've changed some of the chapter and verses, but for the most part, all the modern translations, they leave all that stuff alone. So for whatever reason, they're not concerned with changing the chapters and verses. 
they may take verses out. You would think, if anything, they would renumber them after they do that. You know, you remove verse 45, well, then there shouldn't be a, then 46 should now be your 45, but they don't do that. They just skip 45, you know, if that's what they remove. So, uh, but so they keep the chapters and verses the same. Um, so people will say, well, then the chapter and verse divisions are not divinely inspired. And I don't know about that. Uh, you say, well, an archbishop is the one who came up with them. He's from the Catholic Church. Well, it's because he's from the Catholic Church. Back then, if you're a believer, you're considered to be part of the Catholic Church. I know he's an archbishop, but still, um, he basically back then, if you were a pastor of a church, if you want to use that term, um, that's what you were. You were in the Catholic Church because that was the church. I don't know anything about this Stephen Langton, so, um, but I would think that the chapters and verses are divinely inspired because God said in Psalm 12 that he has purified his word seven times as tried in a fire and that he will preserve it forever. There's an excellent article out on the internet about the seven purifications of the Word of God leading up to the seventh one being the King James Bible coming out. Um, so, you know, I don't, again, I don't know how true all that is. It's good reading. Um, but that's where I found out about the Stephen Langton thing that he came up with the chapters and verses, and that was one of the purifications. And to me, it makes sense. I don't think you look at God's Word, if He promised to preserve it and every word without error. If God's going to do that, you would think also that all these chapter and verses that we have would be divinely inspired too. That God would make sure, and that would be one of the seven purifications of His Word. So that, that makes sense to me. Uh, the reason we have them, I mean, you don't really need those, I guess, but it just makes it a lot easier to refer to. You know, when I'm doing my messages, I'll tell you, well, tell it, turn to Colossians 3, chapter 16. Um, it's a lot easier to find specific because that's how the Holy Ghost teaches you according to 1 Corinthians 2 is comparing spiritual with spiritual spiritual things with spiritual to take verses and um, teach you spiritual things with those verses and so it's a lot easier to find if you've got those chapter and verse divisions and you can learn these spiritual concepts that the Holy Ghost teaches you by looking at specific verses. You know, I learn about our dry baptism into Christ that is not water based upon Romans 6, 3, and 4, 1 Corinthians 12, I think it's around verse uh, 20 something. Um, no, no, it's really verse 13 and 14. Um, then you look at uh, Colossians 2, verses 11 through 13. You can look at Ephesians 4, 5, the one baptism. So there are several verses that you got to put together to figure out uh, that we're dry baptized by the Holy Ghost into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 4 helps you understand that as well. So you got all these different verses, and it's a lot easier if you could call out a chapter or verse than to say, well, it's somewhere there in Romans. You know, almost not quite halfway you know, about uh, a third of the way in, maybe a little more. Um, well, it's a lot easier to say Romans 6, 3, and 4. A lot easier to find it, too, than, than that. So, I think that's why uh, God did that. I think God knew that you had that period of the Dark Ages, and uh, there was a recovery of truth. You have Wycliffe coming out with that first English Bible. A lot of translations after that, culminating in the 1611 King James. And so God, knowing that there would be a resurgence of his word, people reading it and believing it, that he decided that um, to have, by divine inspiration, to have Stephen Langton come up with the chapters and verses. That's what I would think. And also, when you look at the chapter and verses, the divisions, it seems like, you know, they fit in line. They, you've got those number, the numbers there. Numbers are important in the Bible. I don't think it's a coincidence that Isaiah has 66 chapters and there are 66 books in your Bible. The You could say that they each one corresponds with a book in the Bible in order, Genesis through Revelation. You know, 
Isaiah 66 talks about the new heaven and the new earth and there you are in um, the book of Revelation I Isaiah 40 talks about uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord well the 40th book of your Bible is the book of Matthew where John the Baptist comes on the scene is that a coincidence probably not so it makes me think that those chapter and verse divisions are divinely inspired uh, you know other little things come up with look at look in your New Testament and look at uh, chapter 3 and verse 16 of every book and uh, that's usually almost in every case it's very significant verse you know John 3 16 is used more than anything else to share about Jesus death for your eternal life well 316s are good in nearly every New Testament book having to do usually having to do with salvation or your sanctification and you know those specific verses John 6 verse 66 he had uh, all these people following Jesus over 5,000 were there with the feeding of the uh, you know, well, the feeding of the 5,000, the uh, loaves and the fish. And uh, in John 6, 66, you have them leaving him. So it's like apostasy. The unbelief of Israel is seen in John 6, 6, 6. And 6, 6, 6 is the number of the name of the beast. It's indicative of the height of man. So there are examples like that all throughout your Bible where you can look at a specific chapter and a verse and there is meaning behind that number. That it doesn't, doesn't seem like it's a coincidence that this is this number chapter or this is this number verse. You know, Romans 6 is a, the first one in Paul's epistles that goes into how we're dead to sin and alive unto Christ. Well, number six is the number of man because he was created on the sixth day. And it's basically the man, Jesus Christ, who takes over with you uh, being identified with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That you are considered dead and Christ is considered to live in you in Romans chapter six. So, it, you know, things like that, when you start putting all the, since numbers mean things in the Bible, and then you start looking at these chapters and verses. Um, and sometimes they don't work out this way, but other times they do. So you look at it and it seems like, and the fact that it's been almost 800 years since this system has been put in place. And it really it hasn't been changed for the most part. The Bible, they've perverted that, changing the text around but no one's bothered with the chapter and verses. Well, the Catholics have changed it a little bit, but uh, for the most part, they leave them alone. All these modern versions, they all use, if I want to look up John 3.16 in a hundred different translations, it's going to be the same text that we're talking about now, that the wording is going to be different because they use different manuscripts and things like that, but it's still the same um, it's still in the same exact same spot in your Bible regardless of what version you're looking at so you could have 50 people out here with 50 different versions you tell them to turn to John 3 16 and they're looking at the same section in the book of John uh, again the wording is going to be different but the the section that what it's talking about God loving the world that he gave his only begotten son whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life that's what they're looking at across all versions so what that tells you is that uh, for the most part the chapters and verses have remained the same for almost 800 years since Stephen Langton came out with them and so um, so to me the fact that it's been preserved you know just like the King James the King James came out in 1611 there was a great attack against it and yet here we are 410 years later and we still have the preserved King James Bible from 1611 so it tells me that God preserved the King James Bible that's God's holy word without error well chapters and verses 
They were put in place by Stephen Langton in 1227, and here we are in 2021, and it's the same chapters and verses. And God's promise in Psalm 12, 6 through 8, that he would preserve his word forever. And it was purified seven times. So it makes sense to me that the chapter and verses would be a purification of God's word. And he's preserved that part for 800 years. And so he'll continue to preserve it forever. And then you put in the, the numbers. You look at the different numbers of the chapters and the verses. And they seem to fit um, you know, the number system. Like I mentioned Isaiah with the 66 chapters. So, um, so I think that... Uh, so in answer to the question, that's where the Bible chapter and verses came from. At least that's what I've been told. Um, that's what research indicates. Again, I can't find it from Scripture, uh, although I can like Second Psalm. I know the Psalms were divided into 150 Psalms based upon scriptural evidence. But the uh, verses... Uh, in there and the chapters and verses for all the other books I don't have any scriptural evidence to show that God had them write it down like that so like Romans you got 16 chapters in Romans um, there's no evidence that when Paul wrote it he wrote 16 chapters and had all these verses in there he just wrote a letter to the book of Rome to the to the Romans and and in 1227 all the chapters and verses were put in by the Stephen Langton and now uh, we've got them that way 800 years later so um, anyway very interesting people will argue and you know say well that's not that's not divinely inspired well you can make the argument that it is but it's not something that I would worry about there's better things to talk about than that you know you want to make sure people understand the clear gospel that that they've recognized that they're sinners and that Jesus died was buried and rose again as atonement for their sin um, and then once they've understood that, we want to make sure they understand who they are in Christ, how to rightly divide the word of truth, understanding that only Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, are written to us today. And, uh, and you know, who they are in Christ, that they are dead and their lives are hid with Christ and God. So they know then their eternal security, which is the next thing. You know, as far as, far as I'm concerned, that's how I would do it. You know, if you got somebody brand new, you give them the gospel, then you give them life in Christ, then you give them right division, then you give them eternal security, and then you can go on from there. You can show them how um, the spiritual circumcision, I think, is a big part of the eternal security argument. People don't want to talk about circumcision. Well, it's because it's kind of gross. I understand that, but spiritually, it's a wonderful thing that our flesh has been cut off from our soul as far as God is concerned. So if I sin in my flesh, that sin doesn't go to my soul. It's not on my soul. It's cut off from it. The flesh is cut off, so it just resides in my flesh. And when the rapture comes, Jesus will take my vile flesh and make it like unto his glorious body. And so then you don't have to worry about it. And incidentally, maybe that's why when we die, our souls and our spirits go to heaven and not the flesh is because after you're saved, well, your soul doesn't have any sin on it. you got the spiritual circumcision, and so then your flesh, if you sin in your flesh, it doesn't reach your soul. So you could sin the very second that you're dying, and that sin still resides in your flesh. But your soul doesn't have any sin on it because of that spiritual circumcision. And so then God can take your soul and your spirit to heaven because there isn't any sin on it, but the flesh still has the sin. So maybe that's why the soul and the spirit go to heaven once you die, the second you die, but your flesh still remains here. And then, of course, at the rapture, then Philippians 3.21 says, God will take our vile flesh, fashion it like unto his glorious body. You get the glorified flesh, so then, but then that means God, Jesus has the time to, change all of that you know he's had 2,000 years for Paul's body uh, to fashion like unto his glorious body he's 2,000 years Paul's been without his body um, and it also makes you wonder how that all happens I mean we know that these bodies they can be cremated they can ashes can be spread over the sea 
uh, you can have it, you know, in all these different parts. And of course, the body is gone. You know, Paul probably just has a bunch of dust. It's been 2,000 years since he died almost. It's probably just a bunch of dust that he has there. Um, but yet, you've got a passage like Jude that talks about the devil disputing with God over the body of Moses. Well, why would you dispute over the body? But yet, he's going to take our vile flesh and fashion it like into his glorious body. So it almost leads you to believe that the body, once it decays and decomposes and everything here, that it is brought into uh, somehow God gets that body if you're a safe person, puts it somewhere, stores it, um, makes you know changes it to a glorious flesh, and then gives it back to you at the rapture. I mean, there's no verse that tells you this stuff, but you got to wonder why would you dispute over the body of Moses when it's just dust now. But yet, that was a very important thing to both the devil and to God. So it must mean that the body does return to the Lord, and regardless of what man does to it here. And also, that makes sense as far as it, uh, you know, how he can fashion it, take the vile flesh and fashion it like it does his glorious body. Um, anyway, that had nothing to do with chapter and verses, but that was just a, a bonus. Thanks for watching.